So I think we waited a few minutes because people were still coming, but it's now time to start. Eh, faccio una brevissima introduzione in italiano per gli studenti che oggi ci si sono uniti a noi. Um, grazie mille innanzitutto per la partecipazione. Oggi avremo, abbiamo come ospite il professor Jürgen Schaffner Bilic, che è un teorico, un fisico teorico dell'Università di eh, Francoforte, che ci parlerà di stelle di neutroni e, e onde gravitazionali, come le usiamo per testare la materia in, in condizioni estreme. Siccome lo speaker, il relatore è eh, tedesco, parleremo, passerò adesso all'inglese e ripeterò brevemente l'introduzione per chi di noi è eh, English speaking. So, it is my pleasure and honor to have today here Professor Jürgen Schaffner Bili from the Goethe University of Frankfurt. Apologies for my German, which is not so good, but okay. <laughs> Professor Bili. Really, we'll, we'll talk us about neutron stars and gravitational waves probing matter under extreme conditions. I'm very happy we have also a young audience. And uh, I would leave the floor to Professor to uh, start the lecture. Thank you, everybody. First of all, let me thank Francesca Bellini for giving me the great opportunity to give this presentation for the general public to you at the oldest university of the world, the University of Bologna. It's an honor and it will be a great pleasure for me. So, I will tell you a little bit about neutron stars, gravitational waves, and measure on the extreme conditions. So, first of all, I would like to introduce to you what are neutron stars, how do they look like. I will tell you a little bit about the matter I have in mind and the extreme conditions we are talking about. And then I will tell you a little bit about gravitational waves and how it fits all together. Extreme conditions here I have in mind really extreme temperatures, extreme densities, and extreme gravity, extreme curvature scale, all together complex. So let me tell you first how do how does nature produce neutron stars? So how a star is a yellow star, one solar mass, but there are other stars in the universe. So we have uh, we have red dwarfs, red stars. Here this is a solar type star. But we also have blue giant stars, and we also have red giant stars. And this is the lifetime, the evolution of stars. And if we start down here below, so the lowest one, if you have just not enough mass so that really <laughs> the stuff can burn in time like the star, it's called a brown dwarf, and it will stay a brown dwarf. But eventually, if there's enough hydrogen there, hydrogen will fuse, the star will start to shine. Right, as a red dwarf, and live for a very long time. Our sun eventually will shine for, luckily, many more billion years, four and a half billion years. Our sun will shine, so plenty of time to enjoy the sun, <laughs> and eventually will increase to a red giant. Then we blow off the envelope, and what emerges is a beautiful planetary nebula. So the shells are illuminated by the ultraviolet light of a white dwarf in the center of the planetary nebula. So this is like the disco in astrophysics. The ultraviolet light, you see all kinds of nice colors in this planetary nebula. And eventually, the planetary nebula puffs off, and what remains is a white hole. OK. If you put more mass into a star, if you go to eight times the mass of a star, then something else is happening. Then, eventually, we will have a blue supergiant that will also blow up to a red giant and eventually it can also become a blue supergiant. But then, finally, it will explode in a brilliant supernova. Supernova is so brilliant, it outshines the light of an entire galaxy, so it's visible really far away. And at the heart of the supernova, what remains is a tiny little neutron star. So that's how nature produces a neutron star. If you go to even more massive stars, eventually gravity will overtake anything there is, 
So even a neutron star cannot withstand the pull of gravity, and also the neutron star will collapse eventually to a black hole. So this happens at 20 to 25 solar masses. So we have a blue supergiant. We have a supernova, but what remains is a black hole. So in a lifetime of a star, three things can happen. Either it will be a white hole, a neutron star, or a black hole. So I guess everybody knows how a black hole looks like nowadays. And maybe not all of you know how a neutron star looks like. So let me show first you first the picture of a black hole. This is a this is M87 star at the center of the galaxy M87, about 16 megaparsec distance from us. And that's a picture taken by the Event Horizon Telescope. What you see actually is the shadow of the black hole. So the black hole is here, that's the shadow. And what is swirling around here is matter accreted by the black hole, compressed and heated up so it shines. But the, the main thing is that we have the shadow here, which marks that something is swallowing all the material and falling into a black hole. Now, how does a neutron star look like? Now, neutron stars much smaller than the supermassive black hole I've just shown to you. But we know a very famous example. There are historic records of a supernova going off in the Trap Nebula called Messier Object 1. And one, maybe there are some astronomers around you. You know the Messier catalog, the Messier catalog, very fancy objects. And the first entry is actually a neutron star in one. And it is in the Trap Nebula. So this is the Trap Nebula. This is actually a picture. Uh, done in the optical, so with a uh, uh, space telescope, you see this, this filament here, and this bluish uh, stuff, that's the X-ray photography of, uh, of this neutron star nebula. And in the core, this tiny spot down there, that's a neutron star. And that neutron star rotates and emits a beam of light, you see here in this animation, and eventually what we see is there's a blink when this light goes over Earth, we see regularly blinking. That's called a pulsating source of radiation, or a short of pulsar. <clears throat> and I can show you more about neutron star. We can really look at uh, how a neutron star lives, basically. So this is, these are several pictures taken on the left-hand side, left side from the uh, Chandra satellite in X-rays. And on the right hand side, we have uh, several pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope in the optical. And what you see here, there's one bright spot here, but there are two bright spots here. And why is there only one, and why are there here two spots? The reason is that a neutron star shines in X rays very brightly, but a, a normal star only shines in the optical, but the neutron star also shines in the optical. So the left spot here, that's actually an ordinary star. And the right one here, that's a neutron star. It looks like a star, and it was for several decades. Uh, <coughs> astronomers were looking at the Trap Nebula, and were thinking, yeah, these are just two stars. And it took them several decades to figure out, no, that's a star, and that's a neutron star. So let's start the movie and see how it works. So the neutron star is rotating, and they are emitting a lot of energy. And you see these this, uh, rings going out. And, and the ring, these rings are actually like, like the flow when you, when you turn off the, the faucet in the morning on, on the sink. You see the water falling down and then making these ripples. You can check this out this evening if you want. The same thing is happening here with this, with this uh, neutron star here. So there's these ripples going off in, in the rings, and there are also jets. Can I go back? Let's start immediately again. And there's also a jet going on. So you see there's a stream of light going down here, and there are some hot spots here, where, where basically the, uh, uh, the emission uh, is hitting some material in the nebula and flashing on and off. Okay. Neutron stars are not alone. They like to have partners, and they take several different partners, actually. Neutron stars can have a white dwarf as a partner. So here's a white dwarf orbiting a neutron star. And what is happening, a neutron star is so compact that he pulls off the material from the white dwarf. So the material from the white dwarf is sucked away 
And as the neutron star is rotating, also this material is rotating what we call an accretion disk. And eventually, the material is falling onto the neutron star and gaining so much energy that there are X-ray flashes going on. And on. So there are some X-ray pulses, and thereby we can tell, ah, there's a neutron star at work within the accretion disk. For comparison here, this is the size of Earth. The white dwarf is a little bit larger than Earth, but not much. And here, this is just uh, the size of the sun. And you see, this, this is very tiny. And the sun, of course, is quite large, has a radius of about 700,000 kilometers. <coughs> Neutron stars can also be accompanied by a blue giant. So this is the other extreme. This is a blue giant, like, for example, uh, White Hood, which is the constellation Orion. If you go outside this evening and look, uh, there's this famous constellation of Orion. And if you, look, if you look sharply, you will encounter that the left up star is red, and down on the right, there's a blue star. And that's that's right, that's a blue supergiant. So there's a blue supergiant that's called White Hood. And here, this tiny spot, this is then the neutron star taking off material from the blue giant. And also here we have X-ray flashes going on now, so you can tell, ah, there's a neutron star already in another star. For comparison, now you see the sun is very really tiny compared to this blue star. You can have several million kilometers in diameter. So, but neutron stars also like to be together with another neutron star. So we know several examples, so we have two neutron stars orbiting each other. And we have one prime example where we have uh, where we see the flashes of both neutron stars at the same time. Normally, we only see one flash of the neutron star. We don't see the flash of the companion neutron star. But there's this one example, we call it a double pulsar, where we see both flashes. And this is an animation by Michel Drama, showing you how this works. So you see these two neutron stars orbiting each other. There is flashes. Now this flash is coming from pulsar A. And here comes the flash from pulsar B e. in, in different uh, time steps. And they are orbiting each other very, very closely. And these two neutron stars are so close to each other that they bend and curve space time. So we can test actually general relativity. And this is a perfect test bed for general relativity. And the agreement is better than 0.05%. So with that, we can measure actually neutron stars. We can measure the masses of neutron stars. And as of uh, last year, 2022, uh, beginning of this year, we know more than 3,300 pulsars. They are summarized in an alien database. And uh, one famous one is the House Taylor pulsar, which got the Nobel Prize in 93. So this is also a double neutron star system where gravity was tested. And the interesting thing is that uh, one can describe this double neutron star only as taking into account the emission of gravitational waves. So this was the first indirect measurement of gravitational waves. That was in 93. As of today, the most precise mass measurements are from the double pulsar. You see how precise this is. The notation is the following, that basically if you have two digits here, it means the uncertainty is just here, these two digits here. So the precision is one, two, three, four digits. So very extremely precise mass measurements can be done just by taking into account general relativity. The most massive pulsar known, and this was just found last year, is a very special one. It's this one with a mass of 2.35 times the mass of the sun. So this is the symbol of the sun, actually. It's actually a, a symbol going back to, to the ancient Egypt, using that's the symbol of the sun. And this is a, what is called a black widow pulsar. You might not have uh, heard about a black widow spider. And astrophysicists, um, yeah, they like to have fancy names. We have red dwarf, we have blue giant, so we have all the heritage you can think of. And we also have you know, spiders, black widow and red black spiders. And the black widow spider, you know, eats his companion. And the same is happening here with the poor companion of that neutron star. So that companion came too close to the neutron star, so that neutron star is eating up the companion nearly entirely. So and that's why this neutron star is so extremely massive. It was just eating too much. Maybe you can't go to the bottom and too much food. 
So let me show you how we can test gravity, how gravity stands and curve in the presence of a neutron star. So these are now two uh, animations. On the left hand side, we have a neutron star with a hot spot where it emits all the pulses and light without gravity. So of course, if you look at the moon, you only see the front side, you will never see the back side. But the funny thing is now for a neutron star, because of the curvature of space time, light is bent in the curvature of space time. So we can look actually behind the neutron star. And that's why you see the North Pole and the South Pole in this picture is taking the kind of strong gravity as we encounter it around the neutron star. So let, let me start the animation. So what you see now is that this hotspot here vanishes on the back side. So it goes down, there's no signal here. But if you have a neutron star and it bends uh, space time, we will see the hotspot all the time. It never goes to zero. You see the brightness never goes to zero. So with that, we can tell really that there is an extremely compact object which is perfect space time. And from the amount it goes down and up, we can even measure the curvature of space time and compare it with the prediction of general relativity. This, is, uh, this measurement was done by uh, the NISA mission. The NISA mission is a mission on board of the International Space Station. So this is a picture of the International Space Station. And this is, this is the detector itself. So it's just a small cube. And it's uh, rotating around Earth and orbiting Earth every 90 minutes or so, scanning the sky for neutron stars. How does a neutron star look like? So let's make a trip to the center of a neutron star. So on the outside, also a neutron star as Earth has an atmosphere, but it's very tiny, so you can't really breathe there because the atmosphere is only a few millimeters thick, it will be hard to breathe uh, for you on that surface. Uh, then if we go inside the neutron star, we will have first an outer crust, so it's really a crust, like, like, like the mantle we have on Earth, it's a solid, it's a lattice. And if you go deeper, we, we come to this darkish bluish stuff here. This is called then the uh, inner crust. And what is happening is that due to the extreme pressure from gravity, particles are basically tripping out of the nucleus. And those particles tripping out are neutrons, and they form a liquid. So suddenly we have a lattice, and between the lattice we have a liquid of particles. And funny things can happen here. So if you start, so this is a zoom out here, what is going to happen here, if you go from the crust to the core, which is then pure liquid. So the crust, we have a lattice plus a liquid, and then in the core, we just have the liquid. So first we have bubbles of the four phase forming. Then we have rods, and then we have plates, and then we have poles. And in order to remember that, uh, as a physicist might to have fancy terminologies, we call those the pasta phase. Why pasta phase is, of course, here you just have the meatballs. These are the balls here. These are the meatball phase. Then we have the rods. This is the spaghetti phase. And then the, the rods forming a plate. So the plate stack on, on each other. And of course, this is the lasagna phase. And then we have the anti lasagna phase. And then the holes are, my apologies. This was not coined by Italian physicists. This is then the Swiss cheese. So <laughs> Italians do not put Swiss cheese on their pasta. But this is, um, I'm not making this up. This is really a technical terminology. So if you, <laughs> if you Google, you will find several scientifically sound articles discussing uh, the pasta phases in the crust of meat. You can if you don't and so the radius of a neutron star is only about 10 kilometers. So this is about the size of Bologna. So very handy. Masses of one to two solar masses. And this is the densest material we know. Uh, I mean, you can make a rough estimate. And you, what you'll find is if you take just the sugar cube, sugar cube of neutron star material, the weight of this sugar cube is the same weight as the entire mankind. So it's extremely heavy, so you won't be able to hold it on, on the screen. Yeah, and there's a big question mark here. I haven't tell you, I haven't told you anything about this, this core here. 
right? We, I, I said there's a liquid here. We have some pretty understanding of what this liquid is made of, but we have no idea what's going on in the core of the and it might be that there's some exotic uh, material appearing in the core of the nucleus star. And that exotic material might be quark matter. So what is quark matter? So let's go down the scale. So as the physicists, we start on a galactic scale. So this is huge, right? several 10,000 light years large. So the light needs 10,000 of years to travel from one corner of the galaxy to the other. And if we go now to the structures we have on Earth, this is matter at the order of stone. The stone has a size of maybe 10 centimeters. We have a bug crawling on a leaf here. This is also about a few centimeters size. But matter is formed out of a crystal. Yeah, and, and the size of the crystal is already just a few billionth of a meter. So it's already quite small. The DNA, which is the main structure of living beings, is something like maybe 10 billion <clears throat> But both the DNA and the crystal are built up of atoms. And the size of atoms are 10 to minus 10 meters, order, or one tenth of a billionth meter. And the atom itself has a core, and the core is quite tiny, surrounded by electrons. And that's called the atomic nucleus. And the size of this one is just I looked it up because uh, normally I say it's 10 to minus 40 meters, and for a non scientist, it would be 10 quadrillionth of a meter, that's the official name. And the atomic nucleus itself consists of neutrons and protons, so the particles which form the atomic nucleus, and which is a factor 10 smaller, and it consists of three particles. You see a blue particle, a red particle, and a yellow one. And these are just the three quarks. So you won't believe it, but we're all made out of quarks. It might be shocking to you, but we are all quark matter. Yeah, so if you would heat me up and compress it very much, it would form actually out of me a quark gluon plasma, so made out of quarks. And the particles which find the quarks together are gluons, gluons, like glue, they glue together. Okay, where do we find quark matter? So maybe in the core of neutron stars, uh, but there's one place where quark matter has a kick for sure, and that's in the early universe. So if we go back in time, way back in time, 14 billion years back in time, yeah, we find actually that quark matter was prevailing the entire universe. Basically, we're going back to slack. So if you compress matter, right? So if you say, okay, now we compress matter, we basically go down in scales and compress it to a crystal, compress it to atoms, compress it to a nucleus, and compress it to quarks. That's what we're going to do if we go back in time, say in Potter and Benson. So, so today we see all these nice galaxies, the living beings, as you see on Earth. We, we see that if we go back in time with the Hubble Space Telescope, we see how structure forms, how galaxies form, superclusters form. And we go back to 380,000 years after the Big Bang, there's a baby photo of the Big Bang. So it means uh, if we see a flash of light coming from the uh, cosmic microwave background radiation, giving us this nice picture here, I call this the baby photo. So this is where atoms form. So at this stage, 380,000 years after the Big Bang, the hydrogen atoms form. If you go back in time, then eventually nuclei are formed. So the helium nucleus is formed and hydrogen is there. And the interesting thing is, uh, <coughs> All the, basically 90% of the helium in the universe comes from this time of the early universe, three minutes after the Big Bang. So 90% of the helium in the universe is not formed in stars, it's formed in the Big Bang. So really old stuff. And if you compress further, eventually you squeeze the nucleus together and then you form quark matter. And that happens at the time scale of 10 to minus half seconds, so 10 microseconds after the Big Bang. And then if you continue, we are eventually come to the place where also the Higgs particle would melt. This is happening at 10 to minus 10 seconds. And this scales here, we can probe with, uh, with heavy ion collisions. So we do basically create the same temperature and densities we encounter in the early universe in the lab. And we do this by smashing the together in a collider. So this is, for example, the RIC, the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider, or 
that's at rotation map, as we would say, or the large headphone collider, which is at CERN C New York. And these heavy ion collisions broke the conditions prevailing at 10 to the minus 5 seconds after the detection. And proton proton collisions even go further, they probe basically the physics happening at 10 to the minus 10 seconds after the detection. So we're creating the mini Big Bang in the lab and can study quark in the lab. So this is the Alias experiment. So the mini Big Bang in the lab is studied here. So you see these are really huge detectors. So the beam is coming from this side and from this side is smashing here, producing all kinds of particles which are detected here. Yeah. So we have, so the Alice experiment here is exploring exotic and quark matter. The huge detectors, high performance technologies and supercomputing are needed to really uh, measure all these particles and to identify and analyze. So, uh, CERN, as you may mind know, is the birthplace of the internet. It's a huge tunnel uh, between Switzerland and France with a circumference of 27 kilometers. So let's talk a little bit about case transitions. So, uh, we have seen that suddenly matter can transform itself from nucleons to quarks. And this is what we call a phase transition. Now, phase transition, everybody of you knows phase transition. When you cook water in, in your kitchen. So this is the phase transition uh, diagram, the phase diagram of water. Here we have, here we increase the temperature, we heat up water. So eventually if you heat up water, it becomes gas. And this is density. So if we compress water, it becomes a solid. So this is ice or, or liquid water. And in between we have then a transition. So if you do ice skating, on the solid, eventually you have this thin film of water forming under your, your shoes, ice skating shoes, yeah, and you're going along this way. So this is where you have uh, ice and the liquid at the same time. Yeah, this, is, and this is where it transforms from a solid to a liquid. There's also one point, a triple point, where all three phases can coexist. And there's a critical endpoint where we say, okay, we can't distinguish, is this now gas or is this a liquid? Okay. And nearly exactly the same phase diagram is conjectured for quantum. So again, we can increase the temperature by smashing to get a nuclei or going back to the early universe, the very high temperatures, and then we have a gaseous phase here. And this we can probe with the Rick, the relativistic heavy ion collider, or with the large hadron collider. Or we increase the density, and that's what we do in neutron stars. We increase the density, and eventually it might happen that we go from this gaseous phase to uh, a dense phase, basically the ice phase of quark matter. And that's what we call the color superconducting phase. There might be also a liquid phase, so this is the phase transition here from, from the ice to the liquid. And by the liquid we don't call it a quark liquid, we call it a quark fluid dust, which exists at high temperatures and high densities. And in between we have phase transitions. Whether this phase transition really exists is a matter under intense investigations, you know, by, by probing it with heavy ion collisions or by studying the early universe. You know, but there's another machine which I will send to you. This is the facility for any proton and ion research fair, which is at somehow lower energy, so it probes the, the density and temperature region here, which is closer to neutron stars. So let me show you a simulation of a heavy ion collision. So this is uranium and uranium smashing together. So let's start. It will be very quick. So this, so this looks like uh, two pancakes and they smash together in a collider. And when they smash together, they will produce a lot of new particles. Let's see how this works. You see there's a fireball creating and all the particles are moving out. And the detectors are measuring those particles and by backtracking these particles, we can get some information about the initial state when the whole thing is exploded so we get to know the properties of the quark matter which was formed at the densest state of that collision. Yeah, and, the, and the yellow and the blue particles are actually uh, new particles created in, in this collision of heavy ions. But we can do also look at other places for quark matter, and one new window just opened is by listening to the universe. 
So we always have been watching the universe with optical telescopes and X-ray telescopes, but we can also listen to the universe by gravitational waves. This is basically the sound wave of space-time, this is gravitational wave. And there are different detectors running right now. So there's the LIGO in Hanford in the United States. There's LIGO in Livingston in the United States. There's Kaka in Japan. And there's Geo 600 in Hanover. And last but not least, there's Virgo looks on Pisa in Italy, who's also measuring gravitational waves. So these, they have several kilometers arm length, except for Geo 600. I don't know why, but Germany has the smallest of all gravitational wave detectors, it's just 600 meters. But nevertheless, it's quite useful because here this is used as, as a test bed to test new techniques and, and then put them back to the larger machines. This is what GEO 600 is for. So let me show you now what's happening when Julian stars are smashing together. So this is a, an actual it's not an animation, it's a simulation. That means uh, really one has solved the Einstein equation to the extent on the supercomputer, including neutron star material. And this was done by my colleague uh, Luciano Vezzola and co workers Kopitz and Giacomazzo. And let's just start a movie and look at it. What you see here is the two neutron stars orbiting each other. Eventually, they somehow kiss each other, they touch each other. Then, like, like an ice skater, pulling back the arms, rotating faster, and emitting a lot of material, a lot of material outside to the universe. And the two neutron stars are collapsing to a black hole. They cannot withstand gravity. So what is shown here, this, this bright spot here in the middle, this is actually the, the event horizon of a black hole, which you see here. And this is cut off. So one important thing is that the two neutron stars are smashing together, but releasing a lot of stuff also to the outside universe. So just remember this. Here's another simulation now, a neutron star orbiting a black hole. That will be different because then just the black hole will swallow the neutron star, but also thereby gravitation waves on it. And in this animation, you will see now that this bluish color here are actually the ripples of space time. These are presentation waves in the game. So let's start a movie. So this was done by Tim Dietrich and co workers. You see the, the yellow spot is a neutron star, the dark spot is the uh, black hole. They emit in gravitational waves. You see down here, you see the waves, how they evolve. Eventually they're coming closer. You see here is a zoom in how the neutron star is orbiting the black hole. And eventually it will be very fast. Watch out. And then the neutron star will be just be swallowed by the black hole. Chip. Good time. But we can still see that in the ring down of the black hole, we can see that, that the black hole got fatty and fat and was eating too much, and we see it out in this gravitational waves, and we can tell okay, it has to be eating a neutron star. So several such events have been observed in several rounds by LIGO and LIGO in collaboration. Most of them are black holes. So this is a summary plot of the last uh, rounds, of the last three rounds actually of LIGO and LIGO, measuring gravitational wave events. So the, the blue circles are actually black hole, black hole mergers. Also the, the purple ones here, these are black holes. So the blue ones are measured Black hole, black hole mergers by the LIGO Zero collaboration. You see dozens of them have been measured. And they're all at a mass range of 20 to 40 times the mass of the sun. So very heavy black holes. And down here are the neutron stars plotted. So the yellow ones are the neutron stars measured from pulsar data I've shown you before. And there's one prime example here where two neutron stars were really seen merging together and emitting gravitational waves and finally collapsing to a black hole. So this is this event here. <coughs> and in between there seems to be a mass gap. So there seems to be neutron stars are between one and two solar masses and uh, black holes are heavier, something like five to 80, even 100 solar masses. So I was telling you that if you have a neutron star merger, it releases a lot of material into the surroundings. 
And actually, our sample is, is a quite old sample. So it, uh, it was born four and a half billion years ago, but the universe is 14 billion years old. So there was a lot of neutron star material enriched in the interstellar medium. And the, the primeval cloud, which collapsed and formed at our sun, had all this neutron star material in it, or other material, which was produced in the entire lifetime of the universe so far. And this is the period of the periodic table, and it shows the origins of the elements, what we nowadays believe where all the elements are coming from. So I was already telling you that the hydrogen and helium are from the Big Bang. So this is the Big Bang, and this is Big Bang. <coughs> but there are also elements produced in red giant stars, in dying red giant stars. So this is carbon and nitrogen, for example, is from red dying stars. There are um, elements produced when, when a white dwarf eats too much and it also explodes in a supernova of type 1a and produces a lot of iron, iron elements. So this is this region here. So the iron we have here is mainly produced in the uh, collapse of a white dwarf, so it's white dwarf material, so to say. And then we have the neutron star merge. And uh, for example, precious elements like uh, silver or gold are produced actually in neutron star merge. So the next time when you see some gold ring, you can tell uh, your valentine this was produced actually in the neutron, neutron star merger. So we are made of neutron star dust, basically. So now I come to three future facilities. One is FAIR, I was just alluding to. That's the facility for antiproton and ion research at GSI Darmstadt, that's close to Frankfurt in Germany. And they have several pillars. They study high density matter with the heavy ion collisions to form neutron star matter. They look also how the elements are created in the universe. And they study exotic particles and antimatter and plasma physics. And as a side product, they also study tumor therapy. So by shooting a heavy, heavy ion beam to a tumor which cannot be removed by operation. So uh, but the heavy ion beam can somehow destroy the tumor, and that's now uh, a standard clinical procedure in Germany and other uh, facilities throughout the world. The other future is the square kilometer area, which is going to be built now in the coming years. And there are two sites. One site is in Australia. They built 130,000 antennas, so these are these antennas here. And in South Africa, this is the left-hand side, with 197 telescopes. And they are looking for pulsars in the Milky Way. And what they are aiming at is that they, in the first phase, they will find 10,000 pulsars and 1,000 millisecond pulsars. The millisecond pulsars are, so to say, the Lamborghini of the pulsars, the fastest rotating stuff, or the Lamborghini pulsars. And they will be fully operational. If they are fully operational, they will detect all measurable pulsars in the world. And last but not least, there will be a new facility looking for gravitational waves. This is the Einstein telescope, which will be an underground facility with an arm length of 10 kilometers and a triangle. And it will detect up to 1,000 more gravitational sources. And will force of gravitational waves. And at present, there are two sites. One might be Sardinia, close by in Italy, and the other one is the so called Eurigio Muse Rhine, that's an area between Belgium and Netherlands and Germany. And that will be decided in 2025. Yeah. So the future is bright for looking for quark matter, studying neutron stars, and listening to the universe, and I thank you also for listening.